GM everyone. Uh, here's another Y Academy guest speaker session. Today's speaker is Leo Alt. Uh, I've known him, I followed him on Twitter for a long time. He's one of my favorite people on Twitter. He's part of the uh, Solidity core team. And he's also, I'd call him a world renowned uh, expert on formal verification. So I don't know if that's a good summary of you, Leo, but uh, yeah, take it away. Yeah, cool. Thanks for the intro. Um, yeah, again, if, if my um, audio is dropping or my screen is laggy, just let me know and I'll try to switch uh, Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, so I used to be in the Solidity core team for a couple of years now and kind of moved away from that being the, the main thing to start the formal verification team at the EF, like um, almost four years ago. And I've expanded now and I have a couple of people working on different tooling for Solidity, Yule, EVM, and ZK circuits. And um, this year I also started uh, doing some code reviews as a lead security researcher at Spearbit and doing mostly uh, Solidity and EVM related uh, reviews and focusing on some zero knowledge um, protocols as well. Let's so close this intro. So this talk, since I know this is more like a security oriented crowd, right? And kind of like audit code review. <clears throat> so I wanted to show just like a few examples of how you can use a few tools to um, just kind of like aid your review process and give you some more, some stronger guarantees over some piece of code. Um, so this is not going to be like a full, like a full on FV specification and proof of your entire system. It's more like how to use these tools in a lightweight manner um, to give you some help. So um, it's kind of like a middle, middle ground. Um, so as far as FV tools um, go, there are a lot of different targets. That's some tools that they try to analyze Solidity, some tools try to analyze Yule or EVM or just different intermediate presentations. And the tools that I wanna to show today are HVM, which used to be bundled with uh, that tools. And it's used to, so it has, it started as a, as a has implementation of the EVM. And then um, Martin added some symbolic execution and some symbolic capabilities to HVM a few years ago, and um, it's still a great tool. And nowadays it's maintained by our team, mostly by uh, David, Monte, and Zoe. And also it's all CMC, formerly known as the Tracker, the tool that I've been working on for a while. And um, yeah, and finally, if I have time, we'll probably two silver. Um, which is not necessarily related to Ethereum or blockchain, right? It's just a improving tool that you can use to sometimes just like encode something. Uh, you know, uh, some of the work done on that with the symbolic execution. I think right after that is where. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so that's one of the tools that I want to show today, and the. Other two would be so Sol CMC, formerly known as SM, SMT Checker, built in the Sol C compiler, and that's something I've been working on. And it can be used to try to prove it's it's it solves harder problems and but less frequently. So when you prove something, if that tool is usually something big, but it's kind of hard to um, get it to prove things on, on bigger systems. And the last thing that I want to show, if I have time, is basically how to use an SMT solver. Um, directly to prove things or disprove things that might make sense or not um, in, a, in a way that's like detached from your um, Solidity or EVM code. And so what I want, the example that I wanted to start with is from the Seaport code base from a recent review for, um, from July, I think. Um, I don't know if, if many people here are familiar with the Seaport code base. Yeah, I'm definitely familiar. Leo, do you know that you're not sharing your screen right now? Oh, shit, sorry. Uh, um, can you see my screen? Yes. 
Yeah, so as I was, I was saying before, I think I dropped, um, there's a lot of assembly in this code base, right? So this is like a small function, but there's like much bigger functions doing assembly things. And um, they also have a reference implementation, which is in here. Um, yeah, which is fully written, maybe not fully, but it's mostly written in Solidity. Um, so one thing that I that I did quite a bit for this code review is basically um, take the two implementations in assembly and Solidity and use HVM to try to prove equivalence. So for example, this is um, the actually this is the old code they had for this function. Um, that's why I commented out this here, and this is supposed to do the same as this function here. Um, do you think it does the same? Assuming you can still still hear me. Can't we can hear you? Yes. Um, okay. Cool. I don't know the hex for C port off the top of my head. But... Uh, the hex is fine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, the Anyway, let's not I'll spoil it. Let's just run the tool. Yeah. yeah, let's just run the tool and then see what happens. So one, it's hard to do this directly, but like one quick way you can do this uh, because they are like internal functions and it's hard. You, you need to find a, give the tool a path to get to that point. But one quick way you can do this. Wait, I thought I had some, yeah, here. So I have this one file here. Let me comment out the correct solution. And then I have this here. So you have a reference or just a string, and then you have the assembly version. So after we do this, I'm just gonna compile the first one to name one. Here, so I have the two binaries. Just remove this compiler added stuff. Okay, now I have the two binaries here and here, and I can run um, HVM on them, HVM equivalents using this. So basically giving the first code, the first binary, the runtime bin, the second one, and you can also specialize which function you want to test directly in a solver. And it tells us that they're not equal. So there is, uh, there is some discrepancy going on, um, between the two things and the call data is basically, I guess this is just the, um, we can check for a name. And the problem is here, wait, this one. So the problem in this one, in this here, is that you're writing to 27, but this cuts in the middle of the word. So in the end, you're gonna have a bunch of, a bunch of probably trash up into the end of the support name, which does show up. So for example, if you, when this code was used, you could see inter scan um, like just some trash after the, after the name. Um, so if you go in the correct one, wait, if we go to the correct one, I need to compile the name one again. Remove this and then run HVM again, and now they are equivalent. Um, so this is pretty handy to just like, if there's a bunch of assembly, you don't want to look at a lot of assembly manually. You can, you can at the same time, while you're looking manually through the assembly, you can just like set up a bunch of these um, little tasks and, and tell HVM to run a bunch of stuff, especially because, so this is a very simple, um, small one, but it could do this for bigger ones, which can take some time. There's a question in chat. Are all execution paths exhaustively examined or do you define some sort of equivalent spec? So that's a good question. So what HVM takes into account are return values and, and storage updates. So if it finds any path so that the input's the same, but the return value or um, the storage updates are different in the two programs, it's gonna give you, it's gonna report you. Um, the bug. 
And if you set the signature here in the input, it's only gonna, it's gonna force the call data to start with that signature. Um, and if you don't set the signature, it's gonna try from any input. Let me see if it does it. Um, yeah, here it proves it. And you can see that it has more paths because here it only looked at the paths with um, the same signature as the function name. And here it looked at everything else, which I guess would be the attempt at a callback function or something like that. And that's a good question because it links precisely to what I wanted to um, to what I wanted to show next, which is this function. Where is it? Assertions. Um, there's this function assert valid here. So this function also has quite a bit of assembly and not only the assembly itself, but it also has um, some pointers and assumes some length and call data and all these kind of things. So I want to do the same thing here. And this one is hard to just um, pull out into a different file and compile that file because um, because it has a lot of things that you import from different things, like this pointer here is a constant that comes from somewhere. Um, same for a, this constant and a lot of other constants. So I think the easiest thing here is to actually just instrument the code. We're going to make this function external here. Because there are no other um, external functions here, they're all internal. Is this, this, this. Uh, that's it. So, and we're going to analyze this file alone. So we should be fine with this. And we're going to do the same thing for the reference. So this is the function. We're going to make it external. And OK, let's try to compile this. Um, so what was the name again? So we go to contracts, lib, as assertions that solve. Oh, this actually compiles. Okay, so we're gonna do um, assert one bin. And then we're gonna do the same for reference lib reference assertions that solve. Oh shit. Okay. Then we have the two bins here. We're going to keep only the assertions one, this one here. Same thing here. Right. So now we can run this again. So it's going to be assert two, assert one. It says that they're equivalent. <laughs> Do you believe it? Um, one thing we can do to wait, I'm still assuming you can hear me. I'm just going to go on. Um, one thing we can do, wait, can you confirm that you can hear me? Just like a thumbs up in the chat. Perfect. Cool. Thanks. Um, one thing you can do, of course, if it only tells you that this is safe, like how do you know that it is actually safe, right? So one common thing is, of course, you can just inject a bug, right, and see if it catches it. So here, what we can do, so what, what does this function do? And this function says, so assert valid, uh, assert valid basic order parameters. So it's basically validating that uh, the call data is well formed into uh, some, some, some pattern that, um, that support expects it to be with the structs and the pointers and everything. Um, so, Let's change something here. So let's put a, like a plus one here. And then compile the first one again. Wait. Oh, this is Yule. Let's do. Um, what is it complaining about? This is 
outside. Okay, so now we have our new binary. Let's run HVM again. Okay, so it still says it's safe, even though I just added um, this tiny plus one in here. So again, the question, do you trust it? Do you believe it? So this goes, this is directly related to, um, to the question in the chat. Because it reverts, that's not some. Can you hear me? Yeah, it was kind of going in yeah. and out there for a second, but you seem like you're back. Yeah, I noticed. Yeah, yeah, I noticed. I have the the app next to me showing if it's online or offline, and I saw that it it, it like switched offline and online again. So, um, yeah. So I was saying that that's why it's important many times to know what the tool is actually doing, which is it's still a big gap between um, developers and FV people, right? Because I know that HVM has this behavior, but it's not an obvious thing, right? And if you're writing, if you're trying to use the HVM equivalents yourself and you see this behavior, like this is, this is buggy, right? It's uh, the, 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 it is obviously not equivalent because I changed the behavior at a plus one pointer check. This cannot be the same. But this happens because HVM doesn't check um, revert, uh, revert changes. Um, so one thing we can do instead, just to continue validating the actual assembly, which, it, which hasn't really been checked yet, we can make it return this valid offset um, Boolean instead of reverting. So here, instead of revert, we're just gonna return valid offsets. And we're going to do the same thing, of course, for our um, reference. But the offsets then here. I'm going to return a boolean and wait. Oh yeah, that's a solidity version, so it's much shorter. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and compile both of them again. <laughs> okay. Let's fix our binaries, assertions. Okay, now, finally. So it showed us that they are different. So when we, when we, set the fun when we tell the function to actually return the thing, um, then it sees that the return value is now different. Um, in which case, when the call data has only the signature, so it's missing all the, all the data that it actually wants to check. Um, this is the whole call data that makes the the two functions different. So we can, let's first fix the bug that we introduced. And this was the original one. So we did this. Let's fix this here. Okay, so it's still saying it's different. So now we finally got to the point that we went to get to. So, I've removed the bug that I introduced, right? So this is the same behavior as before, just that instead of each function reverting when the, the input is not valid, it's just returning it. Um, so we have two pure functions and then they're supposed to be equivalent, but then the solver is telling us, well, these functions are not equivalent when you don't have any data, when your data is only the signature. So as we can see in the function itself, it's using a lot of like, you can see here in the, in the comments, so we have um, 
zero, like uh, 32 is that there's something in position 0x20, there's something in position 0x240, there's something like in all of these positions here. And, but none of this matters because our call data is basically empty at this point. Um, so it's basically telling us that these two functions are not equivalent in that case. So there's something we're missing here that we're not understanding here. If we go to the reference one, it might help us understand a bit more what's happening. Um, so you can see that it, it, it does rely on reading data that is quite high up on, on message data. So it reads up to position um, 643, right? Up to this, this is, this is the, the highest position to read here, right? So um, what we can do, let's just add a requirement that message length needs to be at least 644 because that's what we're reading, right? Um, this is like an unwritten requirement. Um, if you don't revert, which is what it was doing before. Let's do the same thing here. Compile again. Wait. Oh, message data length. Okay, I need to compile the second one. So again, remove our extra stuff. And run HPM. Okay, now it gives us a lot more confidence. So we found in this, during this whole process, what we did in the end, we found an unwritten um, assumption, right? So there, there's a certain assumption um, that is not explicitly written and this function in the reference is not explicitly written in this function, which is written basically entirely in assembly, but it's essential to proving the equivalence of the two functions. So in the end, after we learned and we added um, this assumption to the function, we can finally prove with confidence that they are equivalent, right? Because we had the buggy case where like we basically fixed the bug and it got fixed and we, we added the lemma based on the assumption that we didn't have before. And then it also, um, it now finally proves it. So at this point, this gives me a lot more um, confidence that under this assumption, um, the, the functions are equivalent. And this is something that um, you know, the people we did for, for a lot of these functions that rely on, for functions that appear, so they don't really depend on the state. So I don't have to manipulate the state to get the point where you can test the function. Um, so it's pretty handy. This is a pretty handy feature from HVM to test uh, these functions that are um, pure and um, and have both a reference and uh, the assembly or optimized version or whatever. Um, yeah, so do you have any questions about this or any thoughts, comments? I mean, I'm just curious how in the world you would know to kind of keep digging deeper like you did, you know, I feel like if it were me, I would just see it passing initially and say, okay, and move on. Like, you know, was it because you saw it accessing the uh, higher offset in the, in the memory, in the solidity re uh, implementation? Like what, what, what would cause you to do this additional digging? Yeah, so the process that I just did now was exactly what I did then. So I ran it the first time and it, and it told me there's no discrepancies and like, okay, yeah, maybe that's true, but a tool that always tells you that something is true is, is useless, right? So I injected a bug and then I was like, okay, injected a bug, I'm gonna see it fail, um, that it didn't fail. So that's what triggered the whole thing because then suddenly it's like what, I, I literally introduced a bug. How is it not failing? This is, that's the bug. So then there's either a bug in HVM or there's something just weird in general, right? Um, that's when I remembered that. Um, and then I, I just read the functions again. And then I saw that there was no, um, there was no returns and there was no storage rights, right? So the only thing they could vary is in the revert, which HVM doesn't take into account. 
Um, then I, that's when I replaced the reverts by the returns um, and then started seeing, start, started seeing the failures, right? So um, yeah, I, I won't really believe a tool that tells me that something is safe if it, tell, if it still tells me that it's safe when I later introduce the bug, right? So that was more the, the thought. So is that just part of your process? Like as a matter of course, you're always manually introducing a bug into like every formal verification test just to make sure? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much what I always do with, um, with FB tools that um, I just run something the first time. And if it tells me right away that something's safe, then I don't necessarily believe it. Um, I want to see it fail as well. Um, because if it says always safe, then it's useless, right? Nice. That's an alpha right there. <laughs> um, yeah, so if there's no more questions in this, I'll move on for, to the next example. Um, this is not done in an audit, but it's a pretty neat example of the tools capabilities and how to use it. So here I have basically the, the open Zeppelin um, repo from master. And I want to analyze our uh, beloved cursed ERC-777. Um, so I'm not going to change the, RC, the, the open Zeppelin contracts at all. I want to use them as they are. And I, I want to see if we can prove something about it um, just as is. So what I, what I did is to write what usually in FV or like in, in fuzzing in different scenarios, there's something usually called as like a test harness which is very similar to like a formal spec. Um, it's not much difference. So basically this is the code that I wrote. You simply import the ERC-777 from Open Zeppelin unmodified. And then I want to write a property for it. And I inherit from it just to make it easier to write everything because I know that this specific tool works best when your test contract inherits from the thing that you want to test as opposed to um, deploying it with a new and then calling it externally, which is how you usually write tests, right? So that's already a difference from um, that's specific to this tool, not to FV itself. Um, but that usually, like when you're writing hard hat tests or foundry tests, you usually instantiate something and you call it from a different contract, right? So you have an actual call when you test things. Whereas for these formal properties in this tool, it's easier if if the if the if the spec contract basically inherits from um the contract that you're testing so what we do here is basically we need to um so that the property we want to test is whether the balance or the total supply of the ERC 777 tokens changes um during a transfer so when I transfer to someone assuming only message sender can transfer things here in this pack so what you're going to do like we're going to save the total supply before the call we internally just let the call go using the, the open Zeppelin um, function. We then read the total supply afterwards and then say they have to be the same, right? So usually when you have assertions in FE tools, you're, what you're saying is this always needs to be true. If this is not true for at least for even a single input, this means a bug um, in the logic, in the compiler, in the tool somewhere. So if this is false, there's a bug somewhere. Um, the other thing we need to do here is also basically mint some tokens to someone. Otherwise, if you don't mint, so the, the, the implementation, the open Zeppelin implementation of the C777 is agnostic to how tokens are distributed. So if you don't mint here, there, then there's always um, zero tokens and the property is always true, right? It's a vacuous property. This is also something to um, that is really important in these FE properties, like the assumptions. So if your assumption is too strict or if, if your assumption is wrong in some way, or if it doesn't represent reality, then the thing that you're proving is useless. That's why a lot of people say your FV is only as good as your spec. Because if I remove this, this property is trivially true because there's, there's no changes ever in the balance of any account in total supply, in anything, because the tokens will be zero from the start. And if they're zero, no one can transfer anything to anyone, right? So the property is trivially true. Um, so that's why we also need to instrument this somehow like this. And this is good enough. 
um, to test this property because suddenly the master sender has um, any amount of tokens. And if there exists a malicious behavior that the solver can um, has freedom to use when trying to come up with a malicious behavior and break the, asser the assertion, it will find it through this, um, be it transferring the master sender itself, themselves transferring to a bunch of other people or just being the malicious actor themselves. Um, the solver with this, this is enough uh, freedom for the solver to decide what to do when trying to come up with a, with a malicious behavior. Um, okay, so after we do this, so this is just, this is basically it. So this is our property and we're gonna tell SMP checker or SLCMC, CMC, whichever name you're used to, to try to prove this assertion. And I'm just gonna run the compiler directly here. Um, no, this is token, maybe, yeah, here. Um, yeah, so basically what I'm doing here, this is just the, until here is just normal compilation. We need to tell the base path is here because there's some imports and the whole import system needs to be figured out with the compiler. This is the contract we're, we're um, compiling and analyzing. That's the one I just wrote, but it imports the entire open Zeppelin, open Zeppelin stuff. And we're setting the model checker options. So we set the engine to CHC, which is a more powerful engine. We're saying we, we're only interested in asserts. And this is the only assert in the whole code base. It's going to be the only uh, query. And we're giving it a timeout of um, 200 seconds. And you run and wait. Um, yeah, this is going to take maybe a minute or two. So if you have questions, go ahead. I have a question about just property testing in general. And, you know, as someone who's relatively new, I feel like that's one of my biggest challenges is figuring out the properties to test. Do you have any advice to- swear, This is the wrong command. This is a command that I wanted to run because we also set the contract that we want to verify and a special solver, which we need for this one. Did you hear my question, Leo? Can you hear me at all? Maybe I'll type it in the chat. Please shoot questions, because this might take a minute. <laughs> um, does everyone agree or like, oh, sorry, I asked a question, but it seemed like you didn't hear me. Yeah, I did not hear you. Let me see if my audio is set up. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, can you try speaking now? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. It's just very uh, low. Oh, sorry. La, la, okay, well, uh, I'll just try No, my, my audio is low. Oh, your audio is low. Uh, just my question was about property testing and how do you like define the properties? Like, that's one of the things I find most challenging as someone who's kind of new to like the whole world of fuzzing and formal verification. So uh, yeah, just uh, how do we define these properties? What are some good advice on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think it's hard to say generically, but a few pointers would be, um, so these tools, they focus more on, um, so for example, if you have, like uh, I had before, if you have two implementations of the same thing, like one basic, one optimized one, that's already a good way to start because you can basically say for any symbolic input or for any random input from a fuzzer, the answer from these two functions needs to be the same, right? And that's already a property right there. Um, another type of property, like the tools like SMT Checker, they focus a lot on state um, they're not very good at math. So fuzzers are much better at math. Um, as in the checker is not very good at math, but it's good at control, control, uh, sorry, control flow. So reentrancy, for example, it's a very hard problem, but um, as in the checker is one of the few tools that actually can um, reason about reentrancy and prove that things are safe, even in the presence of potential syntactic reentrancy or find bugs that are caused with reentrancy which fuzzers have a harder time with. So it's complementary things. 
but if you have a certain state and you can also say like how do my state variables interact so th does my contract have a sort of state machine um shape um you know so how, how do my state variables interact after a certain amount of calls is there something that must always be true when a certain state variable is is in a certain state um the other thing the other hence a bit more generic it's more like um, so I use Foundry and if I'm writing contracts and in your use case, you, when, you, when you write a concrete test function, you write values for the inputs, right? To say like x equals two, y equals three, and then I call my contract um, on transfer to some person, um, person zero uh, in amount of five and, my, and then my balance needs to decrease by five, right? So if you start thinking in terms of symbolic inputs, then the properties come a lot more naturally to you. So if you think in terms of like, instead of writing a test where I transfer um, 10 ETH to contract five, what happens if I transfer X ETH to contract A? You know, so then you start, then you start to, um, then my expectation of the test is not gonna be that my balance is balance minus five, that my balance is balance minus X. Right, which which is already a property that FE tools can um, can play with. Um, so I think if you start thinking in terms of symbolic inputs, the properties come a lot more naturally. Awesome, those are great. Um, yeah, so it actually finished. Um, so it's telling us that an assertion violation happens here. That it is possible to do something during a transfer that causes our post supply to be different from our previous supply. And it took, yeah, 48 seconds. And in this case, it's not showing as a counter example. So that's like next step in for these solvers that when they prove that something is, so it, at this point it proved that it's possible to break the assertion. Um, the, the way to break the assertion is a next step for the solver that's sometimes a bit like an actual difficulty to find. Um, so it's not telling us how it breaks, but we know that it breaks um, because of reentrancy, right? So um, the ERC transfer function, so the ERC777 has the transfer hook, right? So when you go to um, call tokens to send, um, where's the function? Here we see that it, it makes an external call, right? To some unknown contract that simply has to have the interface um, IERC777 sender. And this contract, for example, if they have tokens and they can just, it can just call or, in, or mint or whatever, or transfer tokens to someone else. Actually, no, they can change the total supply, they have to burn, right? So they can burn some tokens, which then changes the total supply and breaks our property. Um, one way to fix this property is, of course, add mutex everywhere, for example, which forbids reentrancy um, entirely, which is what I did in this new file, which I wrote myself just for an example. So it's uh, the same ERC777, but you have a mutex um, lock um, like this for all the state mutating public functions. And then what we do now, um, there's a different dress harness. This one, which is basically, it's the same one. I just wrote a different file with safe that imports the mutex version instead of the standard version. Um, and what we can do now is just run this over again. This might take another minute and hopefully we won't see this. And if it doesn't tell you that something happens or might happen, which is the case, which is what it does when the solver cannot prove something, um, then it means that it actually proved that, it, that this assertion is true for every single possible input scenario that you can ever come up with. So this is the solver just telling us that it started. Okay, any more questions? This will take another minute. Uh, 
Um, oh, so starting from an assembly code with no documentation, you decode it, check equivalence, probably not going to pass. So you then tweak the decoded solidity and retry, repeat. Have you done something like this? That is your equivalence binary as a way to confirm your understanding of the assembly strike. Yeah, that's so. What I what I was showing with the the C port assembly case is 100% what I did during the audit itself. Um, so I started reading code, get familiar with the code, a bunch of assembly. I'm not going to have time to read and decode all this assembly, um, especially with all the pointers. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. It's basically a, in. There's a lot of that in the, in the C port code base for memory optimization. They have a lot of custom ABI decoding, and um, it's much faster for me to just try to use HVM to prove equivalence to a certain amount of to a certain amount of confidence. Right? It's never 100%. Also, when you read it yourself, so um, it's much faster for me to do that and immediately have um, a certain degree of confidence than to read all that assembly myself, which is which is going to take some time. Um, yeah, that was just the question in the chat. So yeah, we go back to USC 777 and the warning is not there anymore. Um, so this means that the solver uh, basically was able to prove that um, the decision is true for every single case. Um, yeah, any questions there? Um, yeah, so how are we on time? Do I have time for a small example? Yeah, we're not doing too bad. We got about 12 minutes to the hour on my clock here. Cool, yeah. Yeah, if you have questions, I just shoot any time. We don't need to wait or anything. So the last um, example that I wanted to show um, is from the Art Gobbler's code base, which Again, not sure how many people are familiar with, um, but it's a great code base, um, has a lot of external analysis. So they have this analysis um, directory where they do what they use, I think, FFI to compare, to basically fuzz the contracts against Python implementations of the whole VRGTA math. Um, but what I wanted to show is, so at some point during the, the code review, um, Harry from Solidity Spirit had one idea and he basically wrote a manual proof for um, uh, for one specific case or like for, for it was basically this rule that if you have um, a bunch of gobblers in different accounts, so if all of us have gobblers, it's it's more profitable for us all to combine them into a single account um, in terms of the generated um, goo, then keeping them separately in all, all our different accounts. So it's not strictly strictly more profitable. It's as it's at least as profitable as um, the first case. So one greater equal the other. And he had this manual proof. And and again, I didn't want to read his manual proof. So I just basically wrote his theorem directly in SMT2. And it's it's really this big. It's only like seven lines of code, has a lot of spaces, a lot of line breaks. Um, SM, SMT2 is um, the script, the input language that SMT solvers take. So SMT solvers are um, theorem provers. You give them theorems, you give them math, you give them a bunch of different logical things, and they'll tell you if something is possible or not possible um, at all. So one small example that I can uh, I can let me quickly this so I'm going to say that x is greater than y and y is greater than z and z is greater than x so I'm telling the solver that these three constraints need to be true at the same time. And then I'm telling it, yeah, just check if this is, uh, this is possible. So when I do this, then I can call the solver. So what do you think? So the, the, the answers that the solver can give are sat and unsat. Sat means satisfiable, meaning there is a value 
there's at least one value for x, y, and z that makes this possible. And it can also say unsatisfiable, meaning it's completely impossible for this to be true for any value you might give to x, y, and z. Um, this is similar to, to um, just like solving systems of, uh, of equalities, inequalities, whatever that you might have learned at some point. So what do you think the answer will be? Is, is overflow allowed? <laughs> I think the answer is no. Oh, this is, uh, this is like just integers. There's I was no just machine. joking. I was just joking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that answer. Exactly, is. yeah. The answer is no, right? It's, it's, it's impossible. There's no way this is uh, ever going to be possible. We can change our constraint system to this. Um, now it says it is possible. And then you can also ask, how is this possible? And basically it tells us if everything is zero, um, then this thing is fine and your constraints are fine. But then if I say, I don't want X to be zero though. And so sure, then I'll give you a minus one. Then you can say, well, I also want X to be greater than zero. And so Y and Z because I don't know, whatever. So sure, then I'll give you one. It will keep you giving you, giving you values in whenever it is set. Um, so if, if, it ever, if it is ever possible to give values, um, it will give you the values. And this is very handy because, so here we had this uh, little math theorem. So we have a, a certain function, some yeah, names here don't really matter. So we have a certain function delta s, um, yeah, which I think is the delta of the good that you would make if I remember correctly, it's been a while. And then you have the different ones is the combined version. And basically here I have a bunch of constraints and then I'm here I'm saying that I, I'm applying this function that I'm applying this other function that I'm applying combined function. And I'm saying that the combined one is actually worse than the sum of the individual ones. The idea here is to get a proof by, by contradiction. So where am I? So this is Okay, so it says um, unsat. And so it's saying it's impossible for this formula to be true. But what does it mean for my, for my theorem? So what is happening here is I'm telling the solver the opposite of what I want to prove. I want to prove that having the problems in the single account is actually worse than having the separate accounts, which is the opposite of the theorem that Harry supposedly proved manually. The reason why I did the opposite is exactly to search for the unsat, because if this is unsat, the solver is basically telling me it's impossible for the combined version to be worse than the combination of the single accounts. So in the end, we get a proof by contradiction that um, the theorem was actually true, right? Um, because if it was possible, if it was ever possible, to find the single accounts that such that um, it's a better strategy to keep the gobblers in, a, in, in separate accounts than, um, than in a single account, the solver would have found it. And it would have told us sat, only sat here with those values, with those accounts. But it didn't, it told us it's absolutely impossible for the single account strategy to be worse. Therefore, the single account strategy must be at least as good as a separate account strategy. So this is something that is actually pretty simple. Like if you know, and this is just like, you might see this weird prefix notation for these operators, like function calls look weird. These are basically function calls to Delta S and function applications in this case, because it's not imperative, it's a constraint language, um, but it's just a language, it's just math. Um, and once you learn these commands and these expressions, you can write um, many of these theorems yourself and basically have a huge amount of confidence that a certain math or a certain theorem is, is actually correct. Um, because these, of course, if there's a bug in my script or if there's a bug in the SMT solver, of course, you, you also have that risk. But besides that risk, this is an actual mathematical proof um, that the theorem is, is correct and it's something we can uh, report to the people that wrote um, the contracts.
Um, and this SMT is actually what most of the FV tools actually generate. So most smart contract FV tools, what they do is basically write this, like take your smart contract in EVM, Yule, Solidity, whatever, and write these SMT files or Horn files in the case of CMC. Um, automatically, it's to generate a bunch of theorems in this language and then run the solvers um, in, the, in the background. Yes, any questions there? Just give this over. Yeah, so I just injected a bug here just to keep my own um, process. So here, now I'm saying the opposite. I want to, I'm trying to prove. Um, so this is entirely existentially quantified. So um, I'm asking the solver, is it possible that the combined version is better than the two single cam? The solver is going to say, sure. And here is one case when it's better. It's not proven that it's always better. It's showing you one case where it's better. It gives you some um, counterexamples, like some values that fit that, that constraint, and then some polynomials that uh, fit the formula as well. That's the question. Is Sertora similar to Z3? Sertora uses Z3 in the background. So what Sertora does, Sertora Prover, they have a pretty strong uh, static analyzer that takes your, um, so they, as far as I know, I don't work for Sertora, so don't quote me on that, but um, I've had many conversations with them. And as far as I know, Sertora Prover does, they take your AVM bytecode, they lift to an intermediate language that they have, an intermediate presentation that's a bit higher level, and you can inform more things. Um, then they do some heavy static, anal static analysis on it to infer or simplify it a lot. Then finally, they create these SMT theorems and also call Z3 um, the background, as well as uh, CVC4 and CVC5. Um, yeah, those were the examples that I wanted to show. I hope you learned something about FV um, and yeah. Maybe you've got an interest and you can start using these, these tools um, yourself. They are they're still not really the easiest things to use ever. There's still a big gap. Um, but I'm sure everyone, all the FV tooling people are working on this. And um, yeah, any feedback on these tools, obviously. I'm sure um, anyone working on FV tooling uh, really appreciates. And you might also, of course, get something out of using these tools on your audits or on your own code or just to learn and prove things yourself. Um, there's a question. Yeah, can I make any comments or or, or generalizations on some of the FV tools out there? Um, yeah. So one big difference is already what it what does the tool target? And most tools target EVM bytecode. And so, for example, HFM, Manticore, um, Sertora. Um, what else? Yeah, there are a bunch of other selections. Let me check my own repo. Um, but yeah, so HVM, Manticore, Sertora, they target EVM bytecode. And one big advantage of that approach is, of course, that you don't need to trust the compiler, right? Um, in fact, Sertora actually found a few Solidity compiler bugs um, during, during manual parts of their, of their audits. So this is, of course, like a huge um, uh, benefit of that approach. The second benefit from the tooling itself is that it's much easier to write tooling for EVM than for Solidity because EVM doesn't change that much. Solidity changes all the time and it has a lot of um, high level constructs that we need to support and maintain. And this takes a lot of time from, from the tooling developers. Whereas um, writing tools for, for EVM is a bit, uh, there's less maintenance to do and you can focus on proving time and research and, and different things. Um, yeah, so K as well, of course. So the KVM is so the K framework for runtime verification. They use it for their audits and they have KVM, which is the EVM formal semantics written for K. And they actually, they're making good progress in making it more usable. They have like a foundry um, mode now. You can just run like, I'm not sure if it's K lab or how they named it, but you can run K on a foundry mode inside a foundry um, directory and it will give you some lightweight results. Um, so this is really great. 
and um, HVM. The HVM team is currently working on some foundry integration to make that easier because it's of course easier to use these tools via the framework that you're used to than just like installing each tool separately and knowing how to use each tool separately. Um, yeah, so K is really powerful, but there's a lot of a lot more manual input, which is changing now. So I'd encourage you to go try out um, the K foundry mode. Um, HVM is really good at lightweight things, um, but it can't really prove uh, like state um, invariance on, on state variables. So if you have um, a property that relies on like inductive invariance, for example, on state variables, HVM is not going to find it. And this is on the opposite end, we have a SMP checker, which focuses on solidity. So it's much easier um, for it to find inductive invariance for state variables as opposed to bytecode analysis tools. Because if you're in a higher level, you have a lot more information to to, to start with and to analyze. And it's much easier to solve loops and contract invariants and, and this kind of things. Um, yeah, on the opposite side, SMP checker is a lot harder to maintain. And the queries that it makes to solvers like C3 are actually much, much harder to solve than the queries that HVM makes, uh, for example. So the trade off is that when you manage to prove something with, with the SMP checker, it's usually something big, like something is really safe with the whole system against reentrancy, against anything malicious. And it can also find counterexamples, even if it takes like 100 transactions, which HVM can't. But most of the time, the solver will just say, I can't solve this, this is too hard. Um, Diligence has a tool called Scribble. It's more like a, you can add annotations um, to your Solidity code, and then it instruments the code based on those annotations with properties such as assertions, and then uses um, and then, you, and then you can use any of your tool to, to verify the assertions that it adds. Uh, Manicore, unfortunately, don't have too much experience with, but yeah, you should definitely try it out, see what works for you. Uh, but more generally, I would say um, just try as many tools as you, as you can, because I'm sure most of them are complementary. So it's not like, oh yeah, I, I have HVM working, so I'm not going to try the others. No, you should definitely try as many as you have, because they all have weaknesses and, and strengths, and um, you only benefit from using as many as, as you can. Okay, if you Thanks so much, Leo. There's so much again. alpha in that answer there. We are over on time, but yeah, I think you yeah. saw the last uh, question or two. Um, if you are up for just spending another minute, maybe we can make these the last two questions. Yeah, so the second last for a beginner looking to integrate FB in their auditing which tool, would you recommend um, I definitely tr recommend um, trying out HVM. Um, so there is a current rewrite going on in HVM, so it will get better in the next months, but you can, of course, already try it out. It's just a bit more annoying to install and things like this because it still depends on Nix. Um, but as you said, you can literally just try it out. It's like a very simple command line um, interface that you can just run your contracts on. Um, yeah, definitely try out SMP Tracker. As a founder integration as well, you should definitely try uh, the, 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 the founder integration that K also has. I would say the ones that have founder integration are the easiest to, to try on because with many of these tools, just like even installing them might be like a bit annoying. So, and last question, is it possible for a FE tool to output false positives? Yes, definitely. As in the checker will definitely output false positives. Um, the reason for that is Usually these tools, they compromise completeness for soundness. What does that mean? Is that if you're looking for a bug, um, they will never alter, they will try to never tell you that something is safe when it's potentially not safe. This is the worst bug you can have in an FE tool and in Z3 and all these other tools. This is called a soundness bug. When, um, when I'm telling you this thing is safe and, and it potentially is not, so this is the worst. Um, this we don't do, or we try, of course, if it happens, it's a bug um, in, the, in the FE tool itself. In the other direction, though, um, in some cases, there are a lot of things that we can't really um, support precisely in FE tool. For example, catch check or hash functions, they're pretty hard for an SMT solver. So usually we abstract them away and we have what we call an over approximation, which is we allow more behaviors than, than the hash function itself alone. Um, so you might end up with cases that are not really present in the program causing bugs and then the bugs reported but then the bug may be a false positive right because it may have um, been introduced by this 
extra behaviors we add when abstracting things that are hard for, for the solvers. So yeah, definitely possible. Great, well, thank you so much, Leo. This has been uh, so insightful, so much alpha today. I'm gonna stop recording.